Okay, good evening. I think we'll get started. There are still a few seats down here near the front. There's some in the very front row. We'd love to have you all in this room instead of upstairs in the overflow, so that's great. Thank you for accommodating your neighbors. I'm getting a strange hum on this mic. Are you, you're, you're on top of it? Okay, all right, thank you. All right, everybody, good evening. My name is Barbara Altman. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, the sponsor of tonight's event. I'm happy to welcome those of you in this room. I'm not sure if we have anyone upstairs in Overflow, but we welcome you as well. And we also want to say hello to the people watching this on our live streaming feed at home on their computers. And thanks to our Cracker Jack staff for getting that fixed at the last moment, especially after we'd promised that we would have it available. It's an honor to introduce tonight's speaker. My remarks will be brief so as to leave a maximum amount of time for Mr. Paul Gilding, who's our guest tonight and who is our 2011-12 Cressman Lecturer in the Humanities. Let me do a little sound check. Julia, are we clear at the back? Everybody at the back in here? Good, okay, thank you. The Luther S. and Dorothy Cecilia Cressman Lecture was established in 1994 with a bequest from former UO anthropology professor and archaeologist Luther S. Cressman. Cressman ex excavated the now famous 10,000-year-old sagebrush bark sandals from a cave in central Oregon in 1938. Cressman questioned some of the received theories about the prehistoric Northwest Great Basin and pushed forward in very important ways our understanding of the human history of this region. The lectureship's goal is, and I state from the bequest, the presentation and illumination of fundamental humanities issues that confront, but are too often ignored by, societies centrally occupied with science, technology, and business. End of quotation. I can't think of anyone more suitable to that topic than tonight's guest. We have used this lectureship for speakers in the fields of anthropology, religion, art, art history, natural history, and cultural studies. Among the guests who have come as Crespin lecturers are N. Scott Mamaday, pioneer of modern Native American literature, who launched the series, and Randall Robinson, the international human rights activist. Two years ago, we had the pleasure of hosting Mary Evelyn Tucker from the Yale School, both of Forestry and Environmental Studies and Yale's Divinity School, who addressed matters of ethics, religion, and the environment. In spring 2010, the Cressman lecturer was Francis Moore LePay, author of the vastly influential Diet for a Small Planet. And in November 2010, the Cressman speaker was Terry Tempest Williams, who spoke on the sustaining grace of witness we have in our midst tonight as well our colleague from up the road at OSU, Kathleen Dean Moore, environmental philosopher, who has lectured as a guest of the Humanities Center as well and who is good enough to come and join us tonight. Paul Gilding is a most worthy successor to the series of speakers I've just named. He's on the faculty of Cambridge University's Program for Sustainable Leadership. He's the former executive director of Greenpeace International. He founded Ecos Corporation in 1995, an international consultancy providing strategic advice on sustainable business issues to leading corporations across the world. He was CEO of Easy Being Green, a company that used carbon trading to drive mass consumer action on energy efficiency. He is the recipient of numerous honors, among them having been named a global leader for tomorrow by the World Economic Forum, granted the Tomorrow Magazine Environmental Leadership Award, named among Time's Global 100 Young Leaders for the New Millennium, and given an Australian Day Award for Outstanding Achievement for Services to the Environment. Gilding is the author of this beautiful book, The Great Disruption, which came out in spring of 2011. On his website, he describes himself as an independent writer, advisor, and advocate for action on climate change and sustainability. A New York Times op-ed piece from June of this year by Thomas Friedman called him the veteran Australian environmentalist entrepreneur, and also an eco-optimist. In an even more recent article, Friedman compared Gilding and his work with that of John Hagel III and John Seeley Brown, who in their recent book, The Power of Pull, suggests that we are at the beginning of a big shift, as they call it, that will undo outdated systems and launch a flow of innovation and opportunity. 
In contrast, Gilding's book argues that our current capitalist system is inevitably headed for breakdown. To quote Gilding, what we have now, most extremely in the US, but pretty much everywhere, is the mother of all broken promises. His book makes the case that a global climate crisis, and with it the end of economic growth, is inevitable. But he earns his label as an optimist by insisting that the challenges of the coming decades will bring out the best in human nature, of necessity, and develop what he calls the happiness economy. It's the title of one of the chapters in the book. You can see why we invited Gilding as one of the anchors in our year-long programming on the theme of conflict. When he agreed to come to the U of O, he said he wanted to make the most of his trip and that we should keep him busy. Well, we took him at his word. After a hectic day yesterday that included events in Seattle and Portland, Gilding arrived in Eugene last night and has been hard at work since this morning, working with students at the Environment and Natural Resource Center at the Knight Law Center, a student leader, meeting with a student leader in the sustainability movement on campus, meeting with students at the Lundquist College of, the Honors, uh, of Business Honors Program. Today and tomorrow, he's getting together with faculty and community leaders in sustainability, including the Sustainable Cities Initiative. And he, he will visit an environmental studies class tomorrow to meet with grad students in that program. You may have heard his interview on KLCC's Living Large this afternoon, and you can certainly watch the interview he's going to do with me tomorrow for our TV show, UO Today. That interview will air in February, but it'll be online much sooner than that, within about two weeks, and you can get to it by searching the UO channel, either on the UO University homepage or through the Humanities Center homepage. Either way, we'll get you there. We're also taping tonight's lecture, so that will be uploaded and online relatively soon. Before I turn over the podium to gilding a couple of practical details, we want to mention Oregon Humanities, the state agency of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and not to be confused with our own center. We want to thank them for their help about for getting the word out in Portland and around the state about Paul Gilding's talk. After the talk, Mr. Gilding will take questions um, from the audience. You will see that we have mics in either aisle. If you would be so good, please come to a mic to ask your question. If you would prefer not to, or if you have mobility issues, we have a cordless mic that we will bring to you. And the reason we ask you to use the mics is because we are taping this and it's going out on live streaming, so we want to make sure we capture your questions. I have a feeling that there will be a fair number of people who want to ask questions, so we ask you to keep yours relatively brief. Um, a couple of more acknowledgments. Um, I want to thank the work done in preparing for Paul's visit by the rest of the Humanities Center. I put a public face on the center, but all the really hard work gets done by the rest of the staff in the office. So I'd like to thank Associate Director Julia Hayden, our events coordinator, Melissa Gustafson, our communications person and designer, Peg Gearhart, Lindsay Rogers, who holds down the front office, Carol Bora, who's also here tonight helping, and all of our usual um, friends of the center who are invaluable to us. Thank you. <laughs> Lastly, there will be a book sale and signing of Mr. Gilding's book up in the hallway outside of the lecture room afterwards. So if you'd like to purchase the book, if you've been inspired, or if you brought one with you and want a signature, Mr. Gilding will be up there, and I believe he said he likes to talk to the people who want to buy his book, so we'll hold him to that. And now we have arrived at the main event. The lecture Paul Gilding is about to present is entitled The Mother of All Conflicts, Infinite Economic Growth Versus a Finite Planet. Please join me in welcoming him. Good day. <laughs> so thanks, Barbara, and thanks to um, Julia and the rest of the team for inviting me here. This is the part of the lecture where I say things that don't matter too much while you adjust to my accent. Um, <laughs> so I'm just going to ramble on about the fact that I live in Tasmania and my A's are funny and I speak with a funny accent and I speak too fast. And are we tuned in? We're we kind of almost there. Okay. Some are, some aren't. Okay. So I'm going to talk to you for about 45 minutes, um, plus or minus 10. Uh, well, not plus, but mainly minus. Um, 
and I'm going to talk to you about the future of humanity, civilization, the economy, the planet, a um, bit of history, a lot of future, and therefore you need to kind of get your mind into that kind of space. Right? So think about time and space being rather larger than they have been for you today. Think about uh, the big picture. In the biggest picture of the world and the world in which we live and your lives and the future of your lives and other people's lives and the nature of our journey on the planet because that's really the conversation I want to have with you. Um, conflict is certainly part of the theme um, but I want to talk to you about a lot of issues around who we are, how we live and where we'd like to go you know, in, in the future. So the context for that is that I um, have spent as Barbara said, 35 years in this area, um, trying everything I can think of to try and get the world to kind of wake up and pay attention and change course. As you may have noticed, that hasn't been going very well. Um, <clears throat> uh, not just me, fortunately, but uh, several hundred million other people have been trying very hard to achieve the same thing, and we're having a few issues, and we'll come back to those issues shortly. But just to give you a sense of framing for my remarks and the sort of basis for them, if you like, the credibility of what I'm about to say to you, is that I have done this as an activist, uh, training myself to gates of embassies, chasing nuclear warships in inflatable boats, you know, doing all the kind of good old Greenpeace stuff. Uh, I joined the military for a while. I served in the Australian. Thank you. Still very proud of that. Um, joined the military for a while. Uh, served in the Australian Air Force as a technician. Um, got involved in anti-nuclear weapons activism while I was in the Air Force. That was very confusing, both for the Air Force and for the anti-nuclear movement. Um, it should be said that I did have a period of my life when I was serving in the Air Force during the week and chasing American nuclear armed warships in Sydney Harbour on the weekends. Um, the Air Force and I agreed that that was not career enhancing and I should you know, consider alternatives, which I did and duly focused on that um, anti-nuclear activism for a while. So I then spent some time on environmental issues, became a sort of pure, having started off on human rights issues, became a genuine kind of environmental activist, focusing on plugging up discharge pipes of bad corporate polluters, became head of Greenpeace Australia, became head of Greenpeace International, ran the organisation worldwide, which meant I had my own navy, which was kind of revenge on the Air Force, really. Um, and, and then uh, tried very hard in that context to get change to happen decided that we needed to engage the business community and the marketplace and then left and formed my own company, two companies, as mentioned, doing strategy consulting to very big global companies, right, to DuPont and Ford, BHP, Billiton. Um, did that for 15 years or so along with another company to really understand markets and how markets work and are markets the vehicle that we need to drive rapid change. Um, concluded at the end of that period that I needed some time to kind of reflect on progress or lack thereof. Um, in this space and took, took four months out from my, from my work in the, in the businesses and just sat, really. Um, read, played with the kids, walked on the beach um, and thought a lot about how we were going. Read scientific reports about the state of the millennium, you know, millennium ecosystem assessment, for example, and just how were we going. And the conclusion I came to, um, in, this is 2005, is that we've come to a point where, you know, I talk about this as the, in, as, as the opening line of the book, in fact, that the earth is full, right? The earth is full is not a rhetorical line. I actually think it is a really good rhetorical line. I was very happy with it. But it's actually a question of science, right? So it is actually just a comment, a statement of fact, that the earth is full. It's full of us. It's full of our economy. It's full of our technology. And there's no room left. And what that means is that we're behaving unsustainably. And we kind of forget, I think, that unsustainably is not a philosophical statement, right? Unsustainably is a technical statement. And when things are unsustainable, they stop. Now, what that means for us is that our economy is unsustainable and therefore it's going to stop. And that is actually really challenging because we only have one idea and it's economic growth as a solution to everything. And so if I'm right that economic growth is finished, right, and the model is mortally broken and will not recover, then we've got a lot of thinking to do about what the future looks like because everything we assume about the future depends upon economic growth going on. And if it stopped, then we have, as I said, a major, major challenge. So 
So let me just stop there and go backwards because that is a big call, right? Given that the, every government in the world, every major corporation, every communist, socialist, capitalist government, right, assumes that economic growth is the essence of our future, right? So if it's finished, we have to really understand why it's finished and believe that because we're going to have, as I said, not just some thinking to do but some work to do as the system unravels. So let's just go back to that science. Let's think about this as a physical sciences issue, right? And remember that this is about the laws of physics and chemistry and biology, right? We've kind of gone beyond the point of philosophy and a simple life being better for us and caring about polar bears, right? This is not about that. That stuff really matters, but this is not about that. This is about the fact that according to the Global Footprint Network, for example, we're operating at about 150% of global capacity. What that means is the number of acres we need to support this economy, right, is about 150% of the acres that we've got, right? The, um, the point of this is that anybody who looks at this draws more or less the same conclusion, right? Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Study of 2000, about 2,000 scientists have peer-reviewed assessments of the global ecosystem services, so not the place we visit on weekends, right, but the things that we need every day to feed our economy. Right, concluded there were 25 or so ecosystem services, and 16 of 25 of those, 16 out of 25 of those are being used unsustainably, i.e., it'll stop. Right? So, you know, it doesn't matter what study you look at, the Stockholm Resilience Centre work in, in planetary boundaries in Nature magazine recently, you know, any study draws the same conclusion, we're not behaving sustainably. So let's take that as our kind of baseline. So I call that in the book, it's a complex Australian scientific term because it's a complicated country, it's called the very big problem. <laughs> right, so we have a very big problem. We're operating at 1.5 times capacity. Now, how does that work? I mean, how can we do that? How do you operate a system past its capacity? And it's called the planetary credit card. So we're borrowing from the future. And people say, but it doesn't feel bad. You know? In actual fact, the reality is many people have come out of poverty in the last 20 years as we've been doing this, especially in China. So things are getting better for lots of people, right? Or at least not going backwards. So why is it so bad and how are we doing that? And the answer is, well, it's like living on your credit card. And we, you know, most of us have tried this at various times in our life. And while you're living on your credit card, it does feel good, right? Because the services are coming in, you're going out to dinner, you're buying the things that you want, life can be rather grand. And then the bill comes in and then you have to pay it. And so you borrow some more money off your credit card to pay the bill. Right? And you go back to work and it's great. And you keep on doing that for a while. And then one day the credit card limit is reached. Right? The bill comes in, you can't pay it, and then it stops. And that's kind of where we are globally, is that the global planetary credit card bill has arrived and we can't pay it. And we're kind of we're in danger of losing the big house in terms of paying for that bill. And that's how it works, is that we're using up our capital. And how that works is that you keep on doing that until you can't do it anymore, and then you face that, that, that limit. So that is, as I said, a very big problem. It's actually not an insurmountable problem, because going from 150% of capacity to 100% of capacity is difficult, slow, but really not that hard. We waste so much energy, we waste so much materials, we're so bad at recycling, we can do this and get back to 100% relatively easily. I mean, not easily but relatively easily the problem the trouble is that's not the problem the problem is that we plan to keep on growing the economy and every assumption we make about the future every assumption in every country is that we'll carry on now right and we'll all become like americans right or europeans we'll all increase our material quality of life we'll have nine billion people we'll all live like that right and to do that by 2050 we'll need to have an economy which is a roughly you know, three to 400% bigger than today's. So even allowing for that dramatic improvement in efficiency from 150% of capacity to 100%, we're going to need three or four planets by 2050. Now, I've had a look, right? They're all a very long way away. They're really hard to get to with 9 billion passengers, right? And we're going to have to live with this one. So the idea that we're going to actually go to three or 400% of capacity on one hand, for some people, is really terrifying and scary. And I'm here to say, don't worry about that. Because the good news is, that's not going to happen. 
because those damned laws of physics and chemistry and biology don't actually change, right, even for New York investment bankers. Right? There is nothing you can do about them. Mother Nature is in charge of them, right, and she doesn't negotiate. Right? This is what they are, you break them, there's consequences. And that's where we are today, is that we plan to go past operating capacity so far that we actually can't go past it anymore. And therefore, this economy is fundamentally unsustainably, uh, unsustainable, therefore economic growth is dead. Right, so the model is broken. I don't mean we won't grow 3% this year and China won't go for a bit more there, but the, 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 the general trend of growth is over. And as you may have noticed, it's, this is what it feels like. Right, it's over. This is what it feels like when it slows down, when it gets more and more difficult, more and more expensive to change, to, to get things to move, you borrow more money, you take more risk, things go wrong. This is what it feels like. So people say, so how does it keep on feeling like? I mean, what does that happen when we get past the limits and where do we get to? Um, and what do we look for to understand what's going on? And I say, open your eyes and look around. Observe what's happening. Imagine it being much more than that and imagine there being no denial about what was happening. Right? So if you look around today at a system operating past its, past its limits, what you see is things like people drilling for oil right, in really deep and difficult places where they can't control it and where things go wrong right, and they can't manage it. Right? And to BP's cost and to ours, right, that's what happens when you operate past the limits. It looks like the weather going pretty crazy. Right? It looks like last decade being the hottest decade on record, the, year, the decade after the hottest decade on record, the decade after the hottest decade on record. Hello, the last three decades in a row have been the hottest decades on record. Right? So that's what it looks like. It looks like the Arctic sea ice melting as forecast, which was terrible over 100 years, looking like it'll all be gone in 30. Uh, this is a, a system breakdown accelerating. So this is what it looks like. This is what a system breakdown looks like as you approach the limits. It also looks like desperate grabs for land. So it looks like China, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, a few countries in the Middle East in the last three or four years since the 2008 peak in food prices, going and buying up areas of land equivalent to half all the arable land in China in the last three years. Now this is a desperate land grab. So they're not buying farms, they're buying countries. Right? And they're moving people off these areas of their country in order to get access to food supply because they have money and they need food and that's what markets do. Right? You go and buy it, but there are social consequences of that. So that's what we see. We're seeing that emerge, we're seeing the use of the militaries in that process and we're going to see a lot of conflict around access to resources because that's what happens when the system approaches its limits and starts to break down. We're also seeing great volatility in markets because any system that approaches its limits gets volatile, right? So you sort of rise up, rise up, and then it bounces around for a long time. It bigger and bigger perturbations and then goes somewhere different. And we're in that process of the volatility. That's why the markets are behaving this way. We're seeing debt, right? We're seeing the desperate need for growth result in borrowing more and more money, right? To try and pump prime the economy, failing to do so, getting further into debt in the process, right? And now we're trapped, because if we grow the economy, right, we're gonna go back to the point of high oil prices and high food prices, even higher than today, which will then put a lid on growth and bring growth back down again. If we don't grow the economy, we're gonna drown in debt, right? So we're stuck in this place in between, and that's where we're kind of bouncing around for a while between that. So this is what we can expect a lot more of, right? This is also what we can expect more of, is, is people being mad. Right? People, I don't mean crazy, you may see that in your political process at the moment, I'm talking about people being angry right? and saying, you know, Tea Party and Occupy Wall Street, I think kind of the same thing really, which is saying, no, it's, it's mad, stop it. Right? You don't represent me, the system's not working for me, I don't like what's going on. Right? With a level of kind of vagueness but directness that says stop it. Right? And that's what we're seeing in those movements is people saying the system is broken. So all those things together is what we're observing around the place. All those things together is what we're going to see unfold as we move forward. Um, I should point out at this point, as I do in the book, that you've kind of, 
you know, we're going to go down for a while in this mood and conversation, right? The kind of jokes are over, we're getting to the nasty stuff, and we will get to that point where we bottom out and we come back up again, but you've got to stay with me all the way through. I'll let you know when we're there so you can stop. <laughs> Have a few moments of breath and go, okay, good, yeah. Civilization's collapsing, the ecosystem's falling apart, the economy's finished, and will the good stuff start soon, please? <laughs> uh, but not yet. So um, that was a small break um, on the way down <laughs> to kind of disarm you so I can deeply dive into side your heads. So the, the reason we're not going to stop going down yet is the same reason we're not going to stop going down in society or the ecosystem yet, and that is very simple because the problem is not climate change, or inequality, or debt, or collapse of fisheries, or forestry, or anything else that we look at. The problem is growth. The problem is the very basic idea we've got about how to advance our civilization is broken. And we are deeply addicted to growth. This is not a casual approach. This is not kind of the current best idea till a new one comes along. This is all we've had for a very long time. Now, it should be said, it's not a silly idea, right? When we were living in caves, when we were hungry, when we were homeless, right? Growth, acquisition of resources, these things were good, right? It's the reason we've been successful as a civilization in many ways, and the reason we've had so many advances is because this idea of acquiring and holding and building our capacity was a good idea. We've just got really carried away, right? And the, I mean, really carried away. And, and if you look at all the great original thinkers behind markets and economics, Adam Smith all the way through to Keynes, all said the obvious, which is that, of course, this will come to a point where we stop growing, because everyone knows you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet, everyone except for all of today's political and corporate leaders, that is. Um, and they said, of course, this, once, we, once the economic problem is solved, one of them said, as in once we have our needs met, we can go back to the important things in life. And they talked about the important things in life and what they were, which we'll come back to. So, you know, this, we, we, we forgot all that and we are addicted. And we're going to stay addicted as we hit our heads against the wall. And as this, this is the PowerPoint part of my presentation. This is the earth, this big. This is the economy, this big. You may have noticed the economy is bigger than the earth. That's impossible, so therefore we're squeezing the economy inside the earth. And what happened a few years ago was that it shrank away from the wall, which is the absolute limits of the Earth's capacity, and now we're bouncing up against them again. Right? And then we're going to bounce off. And it's going to hurt. Then we're going to do it again. Then we'll bounce off. And we'll do it again. And we'll keep on doing that until we recognise that actually those walls are there and they're not negotiable because they are the laws of physics and chemistry and biology and they're not going to change for us. And then we'll recognise that we've got a problem and we, we're going to have a crisis about that, and then we'll start to fix it. This is the moment for gentle reflection. <laughs> <clears throat> so, we're there. <sighs> we're there. So, the good news in this and there is actually really good news in this, is that we are, we're going to have the mother of all conflicts and crises. And we are really good in a crisis. Right? We are going to have conflict, because this is the ultimate conflict, the theme of tonight's lecture, right? is this is the conflict between us and the planet. Right? It's not a conflict of philosophy or ideas, it's a physical conflict right? between us and the idea that we're going to have infinite growth on a finite planet. It's going to lead to local conflict. There is going to be wars over resources, wars over many things. And the sad news is in that crisis, right, there's going to be a great deal of suffering, which I'll come back to in a moment. But let's remember, in a crisis, we're good, right? We're, we actually have proven ourselves historically over very long periods of time that when, unfortunately, we behave really badly when things are going well, we we'll behave really well when things are going badly. So the good news is, things are going to go badly, and we're going to behave really well. <laughs> and then you sort of say, okay, well, is that, is that kind of possible? You know, can we do that? And, and of course, you know, in, in here is the vexed issue of hope and despair, right? How do you respond? 
to the loss of half of biodiversity? How do you respond to billions of people suffering? Right? And there is great dilemmas we can come back to in questions about how do you deal with that grief and that sadness and how do you move on? You know, I've spent a lot of time working through that process, being angry, being annoyed, being sad, coming to terms with the reality of where we are, and it's a difficult process. But eventually, you get to the point where you say, okay, well, it is what it is. This is where we are. Right? We've come to the end of growth. We've come to the breakdown of the ecosystem. There's going to be consequences, and we're going to move on. And when we move on, as I said, we're going to be really good. And then you come to the question, of, okay, okay, so how good do we have to be? I mean, do we have to be really good or incomprehensibly good or miraculously good? Right? And how difficult is the task? And the answer is really good news. It's actually not very difficult. We don't have to be miraculously good, but it's got to be reasonably good. A bit above average, based on history. And that's okay, because actually we're pretty good at being a bit above average. We're not always good at doing the miracle thing, but we're kind of quite good at being really focused and determined to achieve something in a short time frame when we have to. Now, I don't want to kind of belittle the whole issue of, you know, there's going to be suffering and pain, and, you know, we can come back to that if you really want to dwell on that point any more than I've made you suffer through already. And we can go to the details of conflict between nations and battles over resources and all that stuff that I wouldn't recommend we spend too much time on. But, you know, the reality is that when we get our act together, as we have in any situation you can think of in a crisis, we respond quickly. All the barriers that seemed insurmountable disappear. Right, we get focused, we ask what has to be done and we go and do it, and we look back and go, well, that wasn't so hard, was it? Right, and, and think about this on a personal level. If you've had a, or a family member has had a health diagnosis, cancer diagnosis, a heart attack, suddenly getting healthy becomes a lot easier. Right, think about a company having a financial crisis and having to suddenly restructure and do things at great speed and suddenly all those things that seem so hard seem a lot easier. Think about society as a whole, you know, um, facing a natural disaster in an area. Think about the people of Japan and the recent tsunami and Fukushima nuclear reactor meltdown. That, you know, those, we behave very well consistently. We look after each other. We suddenly dis rediscover altruism. We, we make sacrifices for the collective good. We do it consistently whenever there's a crisis, whenever we're threatened. We do it in war. Right? And I, think, I still think World War II is kind of the iconic example of what we're talking about here in terms of our ability to turn the situation around. And you know, there are so many lessons to be learned from World War II in Europe and the US as to what we're capable of. We're certainly capable of dramatic economic transformation of our industries, as we did then. Remember this in the context of the arguments about policy on climate change that after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the US government banned the production of civilian automobiles in four days. Right? There was no negotiation. There was no discussion about the relative merits of it. There was no compensation. It was like, hello, Mr. Ford, this is what you're doing now. Now, Henry Ford had great sympathy for the Nazis. I mean, there was actually, the truth is, there was a lot of resistance to this. But you didn't argue at that point because the country was in crisis. Once a crisis is declared, the rules change. In Europe, Again, you know, once the trigger was pressed, and it wasn't as dramatic as Pearl Harbor, it was like a, a shifting in the end of denial about the issue, remembering that in Europe it wasn't like there was a sudden event. It wasn't like, you know, we historically say, oh, invasion of Poland, war's declared, off we go, get organised, we won. That, was, that wasn't so hard, was it? it? It's actually a lot more complicated than that. Not least of all for Winston Churchill, who spent years as we are in the climate movement now saying, Will these people ever wake up? This is so obvious. Hitler is an incomprehensibly evil threat to global stability, right? And he's invading countries, right? And we're sitting here looking at it and the evidence is mounting and the response is, well, it can't, the threat isn't that bad. You know, didn't like Poland anyway, you can have France, as long as he goes left after that, she'll be right. <laughs> right? Um, well, we can't afford to respond anyway, and our military's not ready, and the people won't support that level of mobilisation, it's all too difficult, there must be a better way of doing this, rather than changing. Right, so really, hello, the same arguments being used today. Same arguments. Too expensive, the threat isn't that bad, another way of doing it. Right, and so can you imagine the frustration that Churchill must have felt at that point, and the belief that we would never change that much? And, you know, that he was regarded as a lunatic, as a yesterday's washed out, leader, a militarist, 
depressed alcoholic. The last two were true. Um, which is a good thing, because he never would have believed in his capacity to beat Hitler if he hadn't have been a bit unhinged. Um, so let's remember, the task facing the UK at that point was absolutely more difficult than our task. Definitely, on the data, almost impossible to achieve, and yet remarkable things were done. I don't want to kind of belittle the incredible suffering that happened in that period. 60 million people who died, 6 million of them, you know, uh, killed by evil, for their religious beliefs. I mean, incomprehensible levels of barbarism, right? Absolute borderline, would we make it or not, during that whole period. US didn't join for many years. It really, it wasn't like a simple process. It was a shifting alliances, complicated situation, and yet, we got through that period, right? And people who survived that process went on, and lives continued. And so our ability to imagine disaster in the future is always scarier. Right? and incomprehensible, and yet we do suddenly mobilise around that and achieve remarkable things. And you know, just lots of numbers around that. In the case of, the, you know, of London, for example, you know, imagine this today, 45% you know, of all the fruit and vegetables consumed in London during the Second World War were grown in London. Right? There were 200,000 pigs being fed every day from the household kitchen scraps of kitchens in London. Right? So there was a US Department of Defence campaign, a bunch of raving greenies, arguing against the use of the car. Is that trip necessary? You know, will someone die for your car trip today? Have you thought about holidaying at home? You know, all this sort of stuff being run by the Department of Defence to preserve resources for the war effort. Right? Women being put to work in factories, which was at that time an incredible social change. Right? Quite incomprehensible. We're kind of almost getting past that point, but not quite. Um, these things take a while. And and that's sort of where we get to. We get sudden lurches in social change at that point and things do shift in ways that we think, you know, beforehand are incomprehensible and then suddenly become not just comprehensible but become normalised normalized in no time. So, <clears throat> a question I'm often, I've often thought about and actually wondered myself until I wrote this book and did the research for it, and, and was, um, uh, I'm often, people still question, is well, when's too late though? Now, when's the point where it's too late? When do we kind of go into collapse? It's as though we're kind of, you know, everything going along fine is one option, and we'll work it out, she'll be right, no problem, technology will come in and save us, or else it's the end of civilization, as though it's a binary question. Right? So the first thing I concluded by looking at it is it's definitely not a binary question. Right? There are a whole range of potentials between everything's fine and we're all finished. Right? And the choice we face over decades is where we go on that range of options. Right? So first of all, let's be clear, it's not a binary question. But then the question becomes, okay, so in terms of the science of climate change, numbers of CO2 in the atmosphere, you know, having to reduce it, how much will we have to do, how fast will we have to be to, um, to do it? And so I did a research project on this with Jürgen Randers, one of the authors of the Club of Rome Limits to Growth Report in 1972. So he's been around on this issue even longer than I have. Um, and you know, we examined this question that, heaven forbid for all of you, we were in charge um, of the world and what would that look like? And what did the science say we should do? How would we achieve it? What the science says is very straightforward. So what we need to achieve is global warming of about one degree centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Right? The point we're almost at today. Right? And that would be difficult, would lead to a lot of sea level rise, but it would man be manageable over a couple of centuries. It wouldn't be inconsequential, because we're seeing that today, but it would be manageable. It's about 350 by coincidence, 350 ppm in terms of CO2 equivalents, so the same argued by Jim Hansen and the 350 movement. So how would we that's what the science says we need to achieve. And we were like, that's going to be really challenging. How do we do that? And so we did a research into what that would look like? And the answer is, it's actually surprisingly easy. I mean, it's actually, I don't mean it's like simple, but we worked out you could eliminate CO2 emissions from the economy, the net emissions, within 20 years, right? We could do the first half of that, 50% cut in the first five years. It does require a warlike mobilisation of people, not technology, no new technology, no new magical solutions to anything, just applying what we have today, right? You could achieve that. And it's not only fast and doable, but surprisingly cheap. 
I mean, it's, it's certainly cheap compared proportionally to the cost of World War II, for example. Right? And it's certainly probably in the realm of 10% of GDP or thereabouts. It would require rationing, closing of coal-fired power stations, quite strong mobilisation of people and behaviour change, as we saw in World War II. But that's the sort of thing you do if your choice is the collapse of civilization. Right? <laughs> and let's be clear when, I, when I, clear when I say it's cheap, it's cheap compared to the collapse of civilization. Right? Which I must confess we didn't model precisely the collapse of civilization, but we're told from reliable sources that it's very expensive. <laughs> and definitely should be avoided. So it's definitely cheaper than that. So, but seriously, it is doable, it is, it is achievable in a meaningful time frame to get back to one degree of warming. It does require us to take CO2 out of the atmosphere right, and to bury it and to lock it up in, a, in soils and trees and a variety of things for the next century, but the thing is it can be done. So if two old blokes on a big envelope, back of a big, very big envelope with MIT's help, um, can work that out, believe me, the brilliant minds of humanity can work it out. So there is no doubt that we can do it on climate change, we can do it on food production, we can do it on everything we need to do it on once we put our minds to it. So the only thing missing is this big switch going on right, in our heads. There is nothing else in the way of us and, and solution. So, you know, an example of that today, to put that into more current reality, is the fact that we have, in the solar industry, for example, the most amazing breakthroughs happening, and like almost no one's paying attention. You know, most people, you say solar, they say, yeah, very important future technology sometime, but it's very expensive, you know, it's not there yet, only works when the sun shines, not really a viable alternative. Wrong. Right? The solar industry is now growing at about 40% per year. Right? So if you think about any industry that grows at 40% per year, that you know, takeoff happens really fast. The prices of solar are currently dropping about 7% per year. Right? So, so for every doubling of capacity, it's about a 20% reduction in price. <clears throat> so that means within three or four years, get this, within three or four years, on most homes on the east and west coast of the US, and in most parts of China, and in all of Australia, right, it'll be grid parity with coal at the house, right? So having solar on your roof will be price competitive with buying electricity from a coal-powered retailer. That is a complete game changer, right? And I had dinner with a few venture capitalists from California this week who are like just going, let me at it, right? There is so much money to be made here. Oh, yes, and it's good for the world. And there's so much money to be made here. <laughs> and I want to help you save the world for a really very important issue. Where's the money again? And so, there is this, you know, another thing that's beautiful. I don't care why we save the world. I don't care how we save the world. I just like to get it done. Right? So if they can help, I'm very happy to help them. Because that's what's going to happen. Right? We're no longer talking about some vague, you know, incomprehensible point in the future. We're now talking about today, both in terms of the problem and in terms of the, of the solution. Because there is just, you know, the, the, the financial crisis we've just been going through. Right? Remember that before that started, we were putting about $100 billion a year into renewable energy technologies. We're now putting around $200 billion a year. So it's doubled during the financial crisis. So just the amounts of money flowing in this area, the results in terms of technology, in terms of opportunity, are just enormous. So this is, this is happening. It's happening today. The only little issue we have is that the lag in the ecosystem from decades of abuse is starting to play through at the same time. But I said we wouldn't do any more negative stuff, so... <clears throat> but when I promised you that, I lied, actually. <clears throat> because there's one more place we have to go, which is, for many people, worse than the death of the polar bears, for some people worse than the collapse of civilization. And I refer here, of course, to the end of shopping. <clears throat> <clears throat> when I have a short break for grieving and disillusionment and... Yep, it's over. So, <laughs> it's over. I mean, think about this. I mean, think about where we've got to as a society. This is the pinnacle of human achievement. We go shopping. <laughs> right? I mean, what do we do for recreation? We buy new stuff. What do we do on weekends? We sort the garage out, which is full of all the stuff that we bought that we don't need anymore. Right? Why are our lives so confusing? Because we're juggling piles of stuff we don't need in credit card bills. Right? It's just, it's, it's come to a point of madness. It's come to a point where it's just not working. 
right? So the fact that we actually don't have the capacity to all live like this anyway, because the earth is full, right, means that the good news is it wasn't working anyway, right? And that an economy built on what Clive Hamilton, another Australian author, calls, he says this is, you know, the basic design of the global economy is very simple. We buy stuff we don't need with money we haven't got to impress people we don't like. <laughs> right? It's just, it's madness. And it's going to have to stop. And the really good news is it's not working because, you know, in recent decades in every Western country, right, we've doubled per capita income and gone nowhere in average life satisfaction. So let's be clear, some people are happier because they're doing better than their peers at college, right, or the person down the road that they compare themselves to, and they feel good for a while, then that means the other person feels bad for a while. So we're kind of dancing, we're changing partners on the dance floor as we go nowhere on the Titanic, which is sinking. <laughs> but the result of that is that the average level of life satisfaction, happiness, etc., is not going up as a result of economic growth. And yet, we're completely obsessed and totally focused on this idea of getting the economy to grow more because it's the only idea we've got, right? So this, this is kind of good news, actually. Right? It does require a bit of, you know, reverse engineering on our heads and psychology and the whole culture of marketing and capitalism and consumer society. I didn't say it was going to be easy. But the good news is the economy is going to stop anyway, so we're going to be forced into behaviour change and then we're going to come to a point where we're going to have to adapt to that new reality. So this issue of the end of shopping is, you know, partly a joke and partly absolutely serious that if we continue on, right, defining human progress as the ability and the freedom to go shopping, then we have got a problem, right? We've got a problem in our heads that thinks that's a good idea, right? We've got a problem in terms of the ecosystem consequences and therefore we're not going to keep on doing it for a range of these reasons. Now, therefore, what do we do instead? Right, I mean, you take away the great source of economic activity, take away the kind of essence of who we are, what do we replace it with? And what we do is we replace it with things that work. Right? And the data on this in the social sciences is incredibly clear as to what makes us happy and what does work. And this is not Paul's personal philosophy. This is not Mahatma Gandhi's argument for simplicity. Right? This is what the science says of what's actually been working in recent decades. And this is what's been working. Being connected. So people who are more connected in their communities, in their families, are happier and have a higher quality of life. Right? Being active, going to the park, moving around, being healthy, now these things are what makes us happy. Right? And taking notice of things around you, smelling the roses, call it awareness, you know, just being aware of the wonders of the world and the beauty in the world is actually a major source of happiness. One of the... Um, uh, interesting ones also is that learning new things, expanding your knowledge, is actually a major source of life satisfaction. That's why books don't apply in shopping, by the way. <laughs> books aren't shopping. <laughs> books, are a, books are a source of happiness. So, whole different category. <laughs> but seriously, learning, understanding new things, recognising that the future you know, you know, is, is, is amazing to be discovered, Expanding your mind is a major source of, of quality of life. And the last one, which I think is really the most interesting one, right, is helping other people. So giving to others is proven, isn't this great when we prove things that are bloody obvious, right? Proven that if you help other people, you'll be happier, right? And if you contribute to your community, you'll be happier, right? So what, what's, what's consistent about all these things is they take time, right? The other thing consistent about all these things is that they're free. Right? None of them cost money. You can borrow the book from the library. It's okay. So that's important because we're not going to have as much money. Right? We're not going to have as much stuff. So how do you structure an economy without as much stuff, without as much money, is we have more time. Right? So the future of the economy looks like less money, less stuff, less debt, Right? More time, more fun, more happiness. I don't think it's so hard, really. The transition's got it. There's a few things to work out, but we'll get there. So what does that look like in your life? So how do you kind of manifest this kind of big theory into day-to-day -day reality and what it would feel like? Think about, could you really put your mind to it, buy 10% less stuff next year? 
right? And the answer, of course, is we all could, right? We'd have less debt, we'd notice our credit card bills going down, we'd have less junk in the garage to get rid of, and life wouldn't be very different. 10% less stuff isn't that bigger kind of detox therapy program from shopping. <laughs> Who wouldn't like to have an extra five weeks holiday next year? Because that's the relationship, right? 10% less stuff, five more weeks holiday, right? No, hello, this is kind of really simple, right? We work less, we have less stuff, we have more time. What do you do with the time? You do with the time the things that make us happy. Right? Now, I'm obviously oversimplifying the great area of steady state economics, and you can all go and read about that, and Herman Daly and all the economic theory as to why it works, but that is what we need to do is redesign an economy that, that looks like that and, and that we're capable of, of doing it. So let me wrap up, throw it open to questions with, with a kind of a comment about our capacity to change. So when people hear this, they think, oh, yeah, it sounds great, but you know, are we capable of doing that? You know, we're, we're just going to self-destruct. It's going to be the collapse of civilization. You know, it's just impossible to imagine. Right? And there is this inherent belief almost that, that the future is sort of determined by something else, that it's inevitable that a certain outcome will occur. Well, let me tell you it's not. Right? The future is defined by the decisions that we make today and every day between here and there. Right? The future is something we decide. Now, are we capable of fixing this? Absolutely. Are we capable of turning around a collapsing ecosystem and collapsing economy into a new model? Absolutely. Right? Have we done such things before? Yes, consistently. Throughout history and prehistory, right, we have done remarkable things when we've needed to because we are a great species. Right? We are, and this is, by the way, about us now. Right? This is about our choice about the future of civilization of the species and do we want to go up a level in consciousness, right, in complexity and understand that we can move on beyond shopping to something of a higher plane, right, because as we do that, that's the choices that we're going to make, right, as to what our civilization looks like. And that potential is just waiting there for us. There is no technical barrier, there is no economic barrier, there is no physical barrier, the only barrier is between here, right, and what's between our heads is actually the easiest thing to change. Right? It's the thing that we can change quickly and globally, and once we do, then the future is ours. Right? And that's the opportunity we have if we choose to go down that path and have no doubt that you know, a crisis is the perfect time to decide to do it. Thank you. <laughs>
Unfortunately, my forecast, as opposed to my desire, my forecast is that we'll actually go backwards for a while in that regard first. That we are going to face up to, actually, not, not more militarism, because it's pretty hard to have more than we've got, but <laughs> focusing that on grabbing resources, on protecting, on looking after, having a delusion, if you like, that we can build walls around this society and somehow protect ourselves from that scary thing outside. But I think we'll wake up. We'll wake up because the reality is that the only way to fix this is global solutions. I don't mean universal consensus of the UN, but I mean effectively moving in the same direction. And therefore, I think cooperation globally will have its day again, right, and will come to the fore, not because of some sort of moral enlightenment, right, but because it's going to be so essential to success, right? And I think that's going to be the answer that we have to do. Hi, Paul. My name is John Hibbs, and I sent you a couple of emails. Welcome to Eugene. Okay. Nice to have you here. Um, I loved your book. thought it was outstanding. But I, I felt this, the weakness of the book is, is if there is a, the weakness, first of all, you're, I think you're talking to the, preaching to the choir. It's easy to have this mindset, a lot harder in the real world. But you keep, in the book, you, you talk very eloquently and, and factually about World War II. Mm -hmm. And but there was a, cataclys a, a cataclysmic a bunch of events that really did happen. Mm -hmm. Poland and Czechoslovakia and Soviet Union and Japan and the Pearl Harbor and everybody got pretty worried that the Nazis would be in charge. Mm -hmm. What I don't where I, what I'm missing here is I if the Martians were coming, I think that the human race would get pretty mobilized and do as you say. Mm -hmm. But I feel that this, we're much more likely to see the frog in the um, in the heating pan. Mm -hmm. And by the time we figured it out, we shouldn't be in the heating pan, the frog's dead. Yep. So tell me about, it again, how you get past. You, you seem to minimize this, this, this problem about switching mindset. Mm. Don't go shopping. <laughs> you, you try that out on your wife for a yeah. while. <laughs> no. Tell me about the cataclysmic event. Again, thanks for coming. Okay. So, so before, before I answer your question, let me just defend women everywhere um, <laughs> by, by, by putting a man in a hardware store. <laughs> All right? You want to see a shopping problem, right? give a man a tool, you know, and, and he'll have all sorts of delusions about his enlightenment as a handyman, and then go home and still be hopeless. So, you know, I know that because I have the same, I have that problem. Um, Look, I think it's important to recognise that there are strengths and weaknesses in the analogy with World War II, right? The, one of the strengths, though, is that, right, it wasn't a cataclysmic event, right? We always think of that in hindsight. In reality, you know, Poland was like the third country in Europe that Hitler took over. In the different political circumstances, they could have waited for France to go. Right. Yes, you think of it that way because you correctly had a single cataclysmic event, but Europe didn't. Europe had denial, obfuscation, avoidance, right, and then decided to respond. And I think that's an important historical you know, perspective on how that change occurred. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but we've actually had a lot of cataclysmic events recently, right? quite a lot. And they're caused by climate change and resource constraint and food shortages and land degradation and fisheries collapses, etc., etc. So in the same way that we've had them before World War II, we've had them here. Now, we haven't changed yet, point taken. So what's wrong is the issue of denial. And the only comparison you can make is to an alcoholic. Right? So does an alcoholic come to their senses about the errors of their addiction when their husband or wife leaves them? Usually not. When they lose their house, no, that was the bank's fault. Right? When they lose their job, no, that was the bastard boss, didn't understand what was going on for me. Or they lie there in the gutter and say, I love it down here in the gutter. This is such a nice place to live, which is where we are today. Um, and so there is that sense where you've got to recognise that's how denial ends. And the issue here is not events. The issue is denial ending. And that's what my point is, that this will take some time yet, because the resistance is very strong. Now, are we capable of doing nothing all the way down? I don't think so. I mean, people do think so. I don't think so. I just don't believe that we're going to stand by and do nothing 
as the system collapses physically around us along with the economy. I just can't see any evidence in history for that kind of behaviour. Right? And so I think we're going to change that. But the main point of that is to say this is our choice. So when people say, I think we're going to be the boiling frog, which by the way isn't true, don't tell this on frogs near your house because we're having a bit of a frog crisis anyway, but, but <laughs> it's actually not true. If you heat up a boiling frog, it dumps out, by the way, which is kind of interesting about that story. Um, but it's still a very good, it's deeply ingrained in our consciousness, so let's accept it was true. It doesn't apply in this case, like, could we do that? Yeah, we could choose to do that. And that's the essence of my point, is that we could choose not to respond. And I don't think we're going to choose not to respond, but we could, and that's the choice that we're facing. I lost sight, yeah. I appreciate your comments. Thanks for visiting our, our town. And thanks for uh, UO, University of Oregon people, for bringing you here. Um, I appreciate your, your enthusiasm and your, and your kind of uh, upbeat sort of, it is an enormous opportunity that we have. And of course, uh, one of the, uh, the issues that occurs to me is, what are the tools that we have available right now that are surrounding us, you know? For example, neighborhood associations, neighborhood programs, civic programs uh, of various kinds, probably things here at the University of Oregon, that if we, if we kind of look at them with, with these sort of mindset changes, you know, that you're talking about, I think everybody here is kind of tuned into, mm -hmm. there's just enormous opportunities all around us. Mm -hmm. And do you uh, have any, any knowledge or uh, one of the most useful uh, approaches I know of, and a number of us here in Eugene, is permaculture. Mm -hmm. Are you, you kind of tuned mm -hmm. into permaculture? Yep. Could, you, could you give me your opinion on, on how permaculture fits into sure. this? And maybe explain a little mm -hmm. bit of what permaculture is. Yeah, I won't do the latter because it will take too long, but I think the idea of an integrated approach to managing systems, you know, is really what permaculture is, is recognising that, that, you know, agriculture is a complicated system and should be managed as such. Right, and, and that I think, you know, one of the great joys driving around this town today, right, was the number of um, urban farms, the number of community gardens. And I think there is just incredible power in that idea. I think there is, if there was one thing that we should all do, right, is to recognise that food production, local food production, is actually really important to who we are, to building communities, right, and to building resilience in communities for what's coming. And it's got a whole range of, I think, benefits to doing that. I think that there is a, there's something kind of at the spiritual plane, at the practical plane, at resilience, and just in terms of economics, of producing more local food. So I think it's a very powerful kind of idea. And permaculture is sort of the highest form, if you like, of that process, recognising that we are working in and living in an integrated system and working with the system rather than trying to control the system is the essence of the path that we need to go on more broadly in terms of the global economy as well. I'm Anne Montgomery of Eugene, and my question is, what about human overpopulation? Yeah. Look, I think it's a, um, it's a really very important question, and it's a challenging question for two reasons. One is that it's actually very hard to adjust quickly, right? So it, there's many things we can do, education of women being the most important thing in developing countries. And we know that works, and we know it's very cost effective and all those things, availability of contraception, there's a whole range of things that we know work, right? So that's clear. However, you know, the, the, the bottom line is in the mass, right? And that is that in terms of relativity to consumerism, I would argue that the, the, the data is very straightforward on the issue that consumption and economic growth is a much bigger issue. And I'll give you the data, which is that between now and 2050, we're going to go from 7 billion people to 9 or 10. They call that a 35, 40% increase in the problem. In the same time frame, we plan to grow the per capita, per capita economic activity by about 300%. Right? So the problem is population is that we should have dealt with it when it was first raised by Paul Ehrlich in the 60s, right. Right? and we would have had a much better outcome. The reality is we've now got to a point where it's hard to manage, right? The, the, uh, the damage that's been done by population is nowhere near as powerful as the damage being done by growth, right? And even if we did do all we could do in that area, 
the increase, uh, the, the impact would be relatively marginal compared to economic growth. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, don't get me wrong. I'm absolutely in favour, right, as someone with five children, of population growth, right, and, and no. I'm absolutely in favour of, of all the programs we can have in that area because I genuinely think it's a very important issue. But let's get some perspective right, about its relative impact at this point in history as opposed to if we'd done it some decades ago. Yeah. Hi, Joe Lieberman. Uh, a few years ago when there was a stock market crash, housing market collapse, and banks were still only paying 1%, I heard that uh, an advisor to billionaires had said when they asked him, where should we put our money now? He answered, um, buy some property, farmland, put a fence around it, get lots of seed, and be prepared. Are you advising a similar thing mm -hmm. in a sense for the masses that people who can't afford to get that exactly can do the same thing in their own communities? Is that where you'd put your money? So, um, are you a billionaire asking, or are you a normal? No, I am not. Because <laughs> the answer is quite different. That's all. So, assuming you're not. So, um, uh, and good disguise if you are. The, the, the. Thanks. Sorry. <laughs> Serious. Seriously, th there is nowhere to hide. So, first of all, let's dismiss the idea that people with money can go and put themselves in gated communities behind castles with their own private security and somehow survive what's coming, right? I mean, just look at the recent leaders of countries in the Middle East who thought they were completely impervious to the people. And what happens is the peasants rise up, ransack a castle, and off you go, right? So there is nowhere to hide, and that's relevant to billionaires and to all of us, is the only way to survive what's coming in a, in a robust way, right, is by resilience. And so, yes, in a way, the billionaire is right, because the billionaire wouldn't know what to do with the seeds, right, wouldn't know how to manage the land, right? And I mean, I'm sure there are very great farming billionaires, but by and large, you need the skills, you need the community to protect, not just physically protect you, but to en enhance your quality of life and to create a system, which what we've always lived in villages what we've always lived in communities is because it works. So what I am advising to everybody, billionaires or not, is to say, let's build the strength of our communities. Let's build the food production in our communities. Let's build the local economic power of our communities. Let's build local jobs. Let's build resilience into the system because that's the way we'll get through what's coming. I don't see what's coming as the end of the world, Mad Max meets the road, right? I see it as a difficult time. Right? And I, I don't think having guns is going to help. I don't think having, you know, being able to hide is going to help. You need to build resilience in communities to get through what's coming. Humans are amazingly adaptable, right? But you have to invest in that ahead of time. We can't do it quickly, right? So yes, I am advising that more broadly for communities, very strongly. Not just land and seeds, but resilience. Thank you. Um, so I have a roommate who's an economics major, and lately we've been having this debate of steady state economics versus capitalism and growth, and one of the things that he comes back to all the time is, you know, the idea that um, technology will advance to the point where it will kind of stave off any sort of, you know, mm -hmm. ecological collapse. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, the, the more and more we really come down to it, it just keeps coming back, he keeps coming back to that response. Mm. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, what would your response <clears throat> to that sort of techno... <laughs> Let me add him. To this sort of techno-optimism would be, and yeah. you know, how can, you know, when I'm having those conversations, what are some things that I could potentially say that, you know, might help change the world? <laughs> so I should confess that I used to have that disease, right? I've had treatment and I've recovered. Um, and that disease is what I'd call a kind of faith-based belief in market economics, right? Don't worry about rational thought. Don't worry about logic. Somehow, markets and technology will magically fix it. So let me give you the numbers to kind of argue against. But remembering that when you have a faith-based belief, and I have a number of faith-based beliefs. I'm not against them. I just don't apply them to markets and how they work or to science. Right? So nothing wrong with faith-based belief, but don't confuse it with how society should be run in a, in a literal sense. So let's imagine that everyone in the world lived like Europeans. Right? So in terms of quality of life, material consumption, etc. Let's assume that we grew a very modestly 2% per year. 
Right? And the reason I use that as a reference point is because it's a moderate level of growth, not satisfactory for most people, but let's just be moderate. Right? We use a European standard of living because it's moderate, relatively speaking, to Americans and Australians, unfortunately. Um, and let's assume that we all live like that because you know, we all think there shouldn't be poverty. Right? And that's, that's the objective now of all these free market fundamentalists is that they attack people like me on the ground that I'm somehow depriving those in poverty of what they're entitled to, which is our quality of life. But let's just give them that for a sec. So that's what we're aspiring to. Everyone lives like that. Remember we started from 150% of capacity? So that world, by 2050, would have an economy 15 times as big as that one and a half times capacity economy. So just put that into your kind of basis of technology. And then remember that beyond that, we go to an economy 80 times that big by the end of the century. There is just no level of technology or markets or capacity that can overcome the laws of physics. Right? And, and just, so just, just show him the chart. Just get an Excel spreadsheet, right? And there's a rule of 70, you know? And if you grow up 7% per year, you double every 10 years. Right, China eight or nine percent every, you know, less time than that. So it's just not possible to have infinite growth on a finite planet. Adam Smith said so, Keynes said so, John Stuart Mill said so. Like everyone who's looked at this with any kind of rational mind has that conclusion, right? And so, and this, so just use the numbers is the short answer. But it's a faith-based belief, so it's very hard to get past with logic. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Scott Fife. Um, I had a question. So when you speak, you talk about the we and the us, the collective, you know, and mm. I think that a lot of times the, the wealthy and the poor have different objectives. I mean, they're taking so much of the resource. I just, I don't see how you can see this thing going down without them taking even more of the resources, perhaps engaging in genocide. I mean, we've seen with this great recession that the wealthy have even got even more wealthy than they were before. And so I see this as as a kind of a class struggle, and I wonder if you think that the corporation and the nation state, which are basically based on the idea of growth, which Edward Abbey called the psychology of the cancer cell, if those things can exist in, your, in what you've proposed. So I think, let me unpack a few of those comments, because I think there's a whole bunch of very important issues in there. One of them is that I don't see this as the end of markets or the end of capitalism. I see it as the end of this form of markets and capitalism. But I think there is something in markets, and I describe markets not as Wall Street, but markets is the farmer's market, right, in Eugene. It's the local store, it's the market stall in, you know, Ethiopia. You know, markets is something about how we organise our society, and there are many things that have worked around that that I think are quite powerful. This is corrupted capitalism, it's corrupted markets, right? It's madness the way we're doing it now. It doesn't mean the whole system is wrong, it means the way we've designed this system is wrong. And that's about government regulation. Right? and limits being put around market behaviour, right? because we have to control markets. And if anyone, back to the college room discussion, dorm, uh, roommate discussion, if someone says, oh, but you, know, you just want regulation, free markets are more efficient, the answer is, well, let's take away contract law. Right? Let's have contract law out the window, because that's only an in unnecessary interference in the market. If people don't behave and aren't trustworthy, people won't do business with them, let the market sort that out. And we'll take away IP law as well. Right? So the thing is, Markets only work as a regulation, and they don't work with bad regulation, so that's what we have to get to, I think, is, is the answer on that. How it will evolve, you know, back to your question about poverty and flights of resources and the behaviour of those in power, yes, there is a capacity, uh, a tendency, some would argue, left over from our reptilian brains to behave very badly in that context, right? And I think some of that is going to happen. So I'm sort of painting a positive picture here because I think we need... We that believe in this need to believe we can get through it, because if we all believe we won't, then I can guarantee we won't. Right? So we have to believe we can get through it, and it's illogical to believe that we can. So therefore, I do paint a positive side of the picture, but I, you know, in the book, talks about war between nations, you know, fights over resources, collapse of nation states in various places. So I think there's going to be a difficult period. It's going to be a bit of an ugly patch, as I kind of slightly understate it. Um, and, and that's really important because I think we have to recognise we are capable of that and we will do some of that as we did in World War II, as we have in many crises behaved badly at various times as, as a species in different levels. But we have got through them. Right? And that's my core point. Not that what you're saying isn't true to an extent, but that overall we'll get through that period to a different place 
right, through, after going through that difficult patch. And so what do you think about the corporation and the nation state? Can they exist? So I think they will change dramatically. I think there's going to be the, the re-emergence of cooperatives as a very powerful way of organising. I think small business will take a much stronger role in the creative phase of this. So I think corporation law needs to be rewritten, right, to put more controls in place and to recognise there aren't absolute rights that we give them today in that area. And I think the nation state will exist in the sense that people will organise themselves in certain areas, right, but I think the nature and the names and the structures of some of those nation states will change. Thank you. Are you picking up this mic? There it is. Thank you. We'll take our last question mm -hmm. from the gentleman in the audience here. Mm -hmm. And just one bit of information for you. The books are up in the lobby, but Mr. Gilding will be down at the table at the front to do the signing. Okay, so we'll have two different arenas of activity. That's because being active and exercise it makes you happy. So we're going to get up and up the stairs. You know. <laughs> and this will be our last question for the evening. Sir? Uh, what is your opinion of the Jevons paradox? the idea that as technology becomes more efficient, the resource actually gets used faster. Mm. That was an article in the New Yorker that was rather shocking. And uh, I would be interested in your opinion of that. Mm. Look, I think this, this is a really interesting issue in many ways. And I, have, I think there's a sort of an extra one we have to face up to. So the first one, which is a, a, a powerful point, is the evidence so far is that efficiency drives material use, right? The resources get used up more because things get cheaper and we use more of them. So that's a problem. The other problem we're going to face, which I'll talk about in the book as we go through the coming decades, is that as energy becomes cheaper and CO2 free, right, we have this very powerful source of energy to do more of that, right? So I think we're facing two problems there. And I think that's where there is an absolute role for a shift in consciousness. And the reason I emphasise the whole shopping idea and what we do to become happy and how we organise our societies is if we just replace polluting technology with clean technology, right, we'll actually just we'll rampage through the resources in a different way on a slightly different time scale, right, and be very unhappy, right, at the same time. So we have to actually have a, a, a consciousness shift in this process, and that's where the crisis is so important. The crisis is a chance to really replicate the idea, which is emerging you know, naturally in society, which is that more stuff isn't working for us anyway. And I think if we don't do that in some way, we won't, we'll, we'll face up to that issue and just delay the inevitable, which I think is a, is a major issue. So I think that's where we have to think differently. It's where we have to put energy and effort into culture, Right, and to using you know, the way we think and the way we communicate globally to change the way we behave right, at quite a deep level. And the crisis is a great opportunity to do that, I think. Let me just close in comment. So thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Julia. Thank you to the Oregon Humanities Centre uh, and people have organised this great trip. This is the reason I came to the US, was around this, this, this visit to here. Um, so I really appreciate being here. It's a wonderful community. You've been a wonderful host, which I appreciate very much. And remember that as we build a new society, it'll come from communities like this. Uh, it will, you know, you probably think to yourself, oh yeah, but we're a bit different. You are, that's a beautiful thing, right? And that, from that base, right, of local farms, of local food, of awareness of what's happening, that's the examples we need to build to give people confidence that we can go to a different place. So what you do in this community even though it's probably a greener, you know, more progressive community on these issues than most, is not a kind of just a nice thing to do for you, which it is, right? It's actually a very important role model to build for society as a whole. So we can look at places like this and say, actually, it can be done differently. It is working, right? We can get there, and therefore it's worth making the effort to do so. Thank you. <laughs>